Hi and welcome to day two of the Keith Bryant Show. I'm here today with uh, Mike from Kaizen, who uh, a lot of you will recognize. Uh, he's done uh, presentations and workshops all around the world on cleaning, coding, contamination, and the various issues that come around these processes. And uh, I want to have a chat with him today about what's new. And maybe to start to say that you know, last year we were talking about cleaning, coding, and contamination. And it seems to be an even bigger topic this year. Um, people are now worrying a lot about contamination left on boards after cleaning, contamination that's left on the boards when they're not cleaned, uh, and what happens to all the processes afterwards. So um, that's probably a good starting point for you, Mike. Well, Keith, thank you for the opportunity to be interviewed by you today. It's always a pleasure. You know, when we think about electronics today, the functionality of these devices are increasing all the time. It's just amazing what what they can do today. And you know, one of the, the key trends that enables that are uh, higher density, smaller component types. And from a cleanability standpoint, you know, if we look back from you know, been in the business for several years, there was wide spacing. You know, even if you ran with a no clean material set, you had a pretty darn reliable uh, device. But in today's environment, we see the distance between the conductive pass narrowing. We see smaller components, a lot of bottom terminated components. And one of the key characteristics of those is that they're being soldered onto planar surfaces. And so you have a, a shorter distance between the standoff or the standoff gap of the component. And what can happen is, is that when that standoff gap reduces, the level of residue actually increases, and your distance between your, your, your conductors reduces, and you're now starting to bridge residues in between those. And, and most people equate reliability on, a, on an electronic device with moisture or harsh environments, but even in today's environment, with some of these devices, we can detect fails even when it's not in a harsh environment because you're, you're connecting the material sets between those conductive paths. So cleaning has become more important. The problem is, is that within that cleaning realm, how do you get those parts clean? You know, if, if you've got shorter distances, how do you get to the residue to dissolve it and to remove it? So, so it's always a challenge, but with challenge, people work together and they tend to figure out solutions. So which one do you think is probably the, the hardest one that causes you the biggest issues? Is it electromigration because you've got conductive pads that are close together? Or is it all these bottom terminated components where you're getting literally a few microns of standoff and you have a large solder area in the middle that you have to try and remove the, the flux and the contamination from? Well, it's an interesting question because one causes the other. When you start to look at... Uh, some of these type of components today, many of them are non-standard. And what we see within the component bodies is, is that I like to equate them to different roads or different, uh, you have different power and ground arrangements underneath these devices. And as you start to trap residue, if you don't have an outgassing channel, you can, you can leave volatiles behind or you can leave those activators, those weak organic acids underneath these devices. So that's one issue. But when you come back to the, to the other question of the low standoff gap, to clean something, you need a flow channel. And one of the things that we know, and industry has known this, the cleaner a device is, um, the better and the more reliability it will be. So, so you know, the, the real question really comes in is, is that can you look at it from a design perspective if you're running a no-clean process to... To have safety built in that. Uh, what if you coat over a residue? You know that that's always uh, you know a big question. Or if you're going to clean, what are the best practices for designing your substrate to where you can get to the material and clean it in the first place? So it's always a challenge, and there's always variability. 
So do you find yourself engaging more and more with the designers in trying to, let, let, let's use the polite word of educate them into the issues that they can cause late, further down the line in terms of not only reliability but assembly and uh, ca capability of process? It's a very interesting question because, you know, in this particular business, the question that, that I often get is, how clean is clean enough? And, and so it really gets back to the design stage. And, and I've been fortunate to work with a lot of different people who, who understand key aspects that are outside of my field and vice versa. And as, as we start to work to try to understand what, what we've tried to, 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 to look at is, is, is to not just guess, but trying to really start to take a scientific approach and, and to really design better test vehicles that simulate the problem and to, to really be able to look at the electrical characteristics and the chemical characteristics. And with that, we're, we're able to start to look at the design stage and understand the best case designs for assembler to to look at from a cleanability standpoint, as well as being able to design better test methods that somebody can can really look at their process and say, "Am I actually develop? Uh, uh, am I actually assembling a reliable device?" Yeah, I mean, one of the things that uh, I've seen quite a bit over the last few years is the the, the question of how clean is clean. You know, and the, the the dunking a whole board in a solution and then measuring the pH of the solution is no longer really okay. If if you if everything was plated through holes, then yeah, that's that's a reasonable solution. But where you've got um, bottom terminated components, where you've got hugely dense BGAs with 30 micron balls on them, then you have specific key areas that you can have potentially dangerous contamination in. While the whole board may pass the test, those areas are probably failing dramatically. You know, Keith, you're exactly correct. One of the things that we have learned is, is that clean, cleaning or assemblies, you have to drill down into the problematic components. It's more of a component-specific issue, in my, in my opinion. And so to, to really characterize a process, you really want to look at where are those problematic components. And if I have a good process to address those particular components, I can take that knowledge and, and, and I can apply it across the entire substrate and I can make a good process decision. So, so today, as we start to look at the problem, that's where we try to drill it down, more into the component area, what are the problematic components and how do we deal with them. So you really need to be looking almost at a at a board by board approach depending on the components that they're putting down onto it to come up with the best cleaning solution. Well what we know across boards is, is that most boards use common components and we know within the component sets which are the which are the ones that cause the most problem. And so one of the areas that, that we said if we know that, why don't we develop better test test vehicles that really focus on those material sets and then study the variables around that, whether it be board design variables, whether it be, uh, you know, different material sets or, you know, you can really start to, to um, uh, drill down into the problem and, and by doing that, we've really started to understand better and come up with best practices. And with the best practices, if people can employ those, we know that uh, they'll, they'll have a better process. But in addition to that, once we know that information, just think about what's going on here, here at the show to, uh, you know, with the connected factory exchange, you know, the industry 4.0. If we can understand what it takes to really have a clean part, and then we can start to leverage that by gathering data outputs and being able to analyze those real time ac across the assembly process, it, it really gives the assembler a much more robust product that they can, they can have a reliable product at the end of the day. So it's really working together across many multiple disciplines to accomplish the overall objective. Well, Mike, thank you very much for that. It's, uh, it's been really good talking to you. And, you know, the, the key message that comes out of this is what we've been hearing in other places around the show. You know, we, we, we're in an, let's call it an era of collaboration. 
you know, you you need to think outside of your box or your silo, whether you're a designer, a manufacturer, an assembler, or even the people who are supplying the, the key chemistries to make the process work. You need to be engaging with the people around you to ensure that you end up with a capable process for today and going in tomorrow. So thank you very much for sharing your time with us, Mike. Well, thank you, Keith. Smart factory solutions for any mix, any volume. Total integrated solutions, allowing you to focus on your business while we manage your production challenges. Delivering innovation for over 34 years and backed by employees worldwide, Norts and Asymtex team of experts are ready to support your next adventure. Hi, welcome back. Uh, it's Keith Bryant's show at uh, Apex 2018. I'm here with Ed from DFR, and we're going to talk about some of the hot topics in terms of failures, failure analysis, what he sees is happening for the future, and uh, what are basically the, the, the hot things that are in the, the, the DFR workshop book today. All right, thanks. So um, just a, a bit of background. Um, I work at DFR Solutions uh, in business development there, and we see quite a bit of um, what the industry is going through in terms of uh, the kinds of failures that they're seeing. It's it's a really interesting place to be because we do about 600 projects a year, and over the course of that, we're working with the automotive industry, working with the aerospace industry, consumer electronics. Um, and as issues start to propagate, um, we find that we have almost like an epidemiological view of what's happening. And a lot of times what we can do is then put out a, uh, a release. If we start to see uh, certain trends, we'll put out a release and, and, and let our customers know that you know they should be aware of uh, these new developments or uh, uh, if they're developing something that's that's using the same kind of technology that they should be aware of this and, and, and we'll let them know how they can test or, or, or check to make sure that they're not putting themselves at risk. So what sort of things were in your latest releases? Um, let's see. I think most recently, I think the most recent uh, point of interest was, uh, I, I guess about 10 years ago, uh, there was a big red phosphorus problem, right? As uh, uh, red phosphorus was being used as a flame retardant in, in plastics and uh, it was being used in connectors. And the problem is, is that the phosphorus leaches out and becomes very acidic and starts to eat away traces and uh, connector pins and things like that, right? So the first time we saw this, it took a while to track down and once we finally did, uh, we worked a lot with the industry to educate them and it had pretty much been eliminated from the supply chain. And we hadn't seen any cases of red phosphorus over a good eight years. And then uh, about a year ago, we started seeing um, corrosive evidence on our boards. We do a lot of uh, forensic analysis as part of our investigations to help our customers out, right? So uh, we started seeing corrosive evidence that reminded us of that time eight, eight or nine years prior, right? So... We went in and we were, uh, we went in and looked for the signs of red phosphorus in the plastic and did some cross sectioning and optical microscopy, and there it was. And it turns out that the as the as the supply chain deepens um, and the quest for cheaper and cheaper products, uh, cheaper and cheaper parts um, pushes purchasing groups. Uh, some enterprising toy manufacturers. Um, or suppliers of toy manufacturers thought it would be a great um, opportunity for them to take their plastics and also supply the component vendors. And over the course of those 10 years, there was turnover in the, um, 
in the supplier chain, right? So the lessons learned were kind of lost. And sure enough, after that first after that first analysis, over the course of the next month or two, we had four or five other companies calling us with the same symptoms. So having having that kind of insight and, and, and seeing that bread allowed us to very quickly help them out and, and, and let them know what was happening, verify that that was in fact their problem and, and show them exactly where, uh, where they needed to go to correct the problem. Wow, so a case of history repeating itself. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah we, in, sort of in the industry, we see a lot of things that are driven by cost downs and this kind of stuff. So, right. Um, you know, I, I guess that's, that's an absolute classic. Yeah. Um, so is, is, is that kind of thing, the, the, let's call it the, the bread and butter of DFR, or is there a wide range of things that you're looking at from individual components that have failed or um, this kind of stuff? It's pretty broad. Um, I think DFR Solutions is sort of more, it, it, failure analysis and component issues and things like that uh, are a small part of it, and I think the the best way to look at DFR solutions is is more like the uh, it's the healthcare system for the electronics industry, right? Our failure analysis is like emergency room work. It's very exciting. Uh, most of our customers that come to us with problems are working on you know really deep time issues. They're working on um, you know lying down situations, or or they're trying to meet they're trying to keep their project or program on track. Um, and correct the problem before before there are significant delays or cost overruns, right? So there's a lot of emotion involved. There's a lot of uh, uh, sometimes even panic, right? And that's kind of like the emergency room part. And we much, we much prefer working with them on more of the preventative side, right? Which we also offer. So things like design reviews, things like um, test plan development to make sure that as they're, as they're working through their program, their product is going to meet the expectations either during qualification testing or even in the field, right? Um, and we also have the Sherlock software tool, which actually will take a design and run a physics of failure analysis on the design and predict how long each solder joint, each component is going to last in the intended environment. So having that kind of insight and baking in reliability, if you will, into the product development process really helps companies avoid those emergency room visits, right? Okay, so is that a software that you guys run when someone sends you a design, or do you let it out to your customers so they can basically do the work and make the improvements themselves? That's a good question. I mean, Sherlock was developed for our use initially. Um, a lot of what we do is very labor intensive, you know, and the, and a, a as a business starting out, the only way that we could sort of improve what we were doing or get more out of what we were doing was to do more in a certain amount of time, right? Um, so we developed a, a number of tools that allowed us uh, to perform deeper, uh, more rigorous analysis of our customers' designs when they sent them to us, right? So we do, we do sort of a, a subjective expert analysis, design analysis, uh, customers will send us their things. Say, hey, is there anything in here I should be concerned about? Is there anything in here that catches your attention? Uh, and we can sort of apply an industry-wide lessons learned to that design, right? And so, as we developed these these sort of shortcut tools uh, and started providing those outputs as part of the reporting that we did, um, you know, our customers were like, okay, well, how can I how can I get my hands on this? How can I leverage this? So. Um, we created Sherlock, and uh, basically, we still we are still the greatest users of the tool. So we'll provide it as a service. Um, a lot of smaller companies who only have you know two or three designs a year, um, it may not make sense for them to bring the tool in house. Uh, so yeah, we have no uh, we have a number of engineers who are who are very skilled at using that tool and um, can also provide their subjective insight uh, to the design. And then the larger companies who um, who want to bring it in house uh, can do so, right? And and it, we find that it really helps companies in their design cycle because the ease of use of the tool allows it to be used actually during layout and during design. And there's kind of a, a 
a feedback mechanism with the designer as they see what works and what doesn't work, um, that designer's initial layout becomes better and better and better because they, they, they start to intuitively uh, understand the impact of their design choices. Well, thank you for that, Bob. That's a, a brilliant insight into something that's definitely needed by a lot of companies within the industry where the designers and uh, the, the, the first level people can basically iron out a lot of the problems that normally would appear either at the end of production or more often than not in reliability of a finished product. So uh, really great to hear about that. Thank you for coming in. Thank you so much. Hi, welcome back to the Keith Bryant Show. I'm here with Brian D'Amico from Mirtech, and we're going to talk a little bit about the challenges that uh, Brian is seeing within SPI, within uh, 3D AOI, as the components become smaller and smaller, the gaps become tighter and tighter, and the tack times start falling down through the floor. So there's basically the background, Brian. You can start anywhere you like. That was a good background. <laughs> yeah, ultimately, you know, as, as the components get smaller, the issue is not just small components, but the issue is the fact that you need on these, you know, motherboards and CPU boards, and they're getting very dense, but they also have very tall devices around them. So the components are getting smaller, the devices are still tall, and they're getting more and more close together. So you get what's called shadowing, a lot of shadowing. So that's kind of an issue that the entire industry has to deal with. Uh, we at Martech, we've always prided ourselves on having the most technologically advanced products in the world, quite frankly, AOI and SPI. Uh, we did introduce what's called the OmniVision system. And the OmniVision system is a digital multi-frequency. Right? So it's, it's digital multi-frequency moiré, and we pioneered that. We've now introduced what's called digital tri-frequency moiré. So what we have, uh, each one of our projectors, we either have four or eight, each one of our projectors can project up to three frequencies for moiré. What that allows us to do is to characterize devices from you know, zero to up to 25 millimeters tall. So as the boards get more and more dense, we have these taller devices, lower lying devices, we're able to characterize from multiple different angles. Using those three frequencies, we're capturing about 48 images with one of my systems. And then what we introduced at the show here is our OmniVision 2.0 head. And what that has is eight projectors. So there's eight projectors, three frequencies per projector for a total of 96 images. Okay, just to clarify something very simple and very basic, you're talking about projectors, not cameras. Projectors, not cameras, yeah. Our top-down camera that we use to collect this information is, of course, designed and developed by Murtek. We, It's a 15-megapixel co-express camera. It's the highest top-end camera out there. A lot of these people around here, a lot of the vendors have wanted to purchase the camera from us. We've elected not to do so because it is the heart of the system. It's our technological edge as well as the rest of our machine. But the cameras are used to capture the images, right? The projector is used to project the frequency of line pattern on top of the regions of interest, and that's what you do to characterize the devices. So you take a pattern, you shift it three times. You basically need four images per projector shifting that, that pattern you know, three times for four images. Yeah, you do that to get the math to get the Z height, I exactly. guess. And well, no, what's Z height? We don't know what that is here. We're in the okay. States. You've oh, got to change that. I do apologize. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess having eight projectors sending the more I out allows you pretty much to get rid of nearly, nearly all of the shallowing exactly. or effectively all of the shadowing. That's exactly it. And that is a top-end system. There's nothing out here that, that can actually do anything like that. Once again, the 96 images, if you do have something in the way and you're going to lose you know, one of those projectors or, or one of the projectors is shadowed, you've got another seven projectors with three frequencies per projector used to characterize that device that's shadowed. So chances are really high, unless you have something really tall on the board, chances are extremely high that we can characterize anything on the board, which is what we're going after. As 
As these boards get more and more challenging, they become very difficult for any vendor to really deal with from an AOI perspective. SBI is pretty much straightforward because you're dealing with just you know solder paste. There's really nothing in the way of the solder paste, right? Of course, with SBI, you do have to have at least two projectors to characterize from either side, you know, maybe 45 degree angle opposition to get rid of shadowing on one side of the device. But it's not like you have anything tall on the board that can shadow you from looking at the solder deposition. So, okay, so you've got a, a really good camera. Yep. And you've got really good projectors putting out the moray. What about the really, really small components? You, you've covered the height, you've covered the shadowing, but what about as components get smaller and smaller and packed closer and closer together? Absolutely. All right, so to deal with that, one of the things that's nice about having a 15 megapixel camera is it's actually scalable, right? So we can use multiple different lenses in order to deal with some smaller devices. Once again, it's a 15 meg camera, so we can use a 10 micron lens, a 15 micron lens, a 20 micron lens, or going the opposite way. We have down to a four, and we're currently developing a two micron lens. So we're talking about two microns per pixel. What happens there is it actually, I'm talking about scaling down, meaning that the FOV, right, the, uh, the field of view is going to get smaller. So you're looking at less real estate on the board, but when you start dealing with very small devices, you know, sub 0105, you do require smaller lenses. So at a 7.7 .7 micron lens, we could process an 03015. That's cool. But once you start getting down to a very small die, you're now talking four micron lens or even two micron lens. And of course, on our semiconductor side of things, we're down to a one micron lens. So you have to start out with the camera technology, right? Mm. Then from there, we scale it down, but we also use what's called a telecentric compound lens. The thing that's critical and, and that we see, and I, I still don't quite get it, there are some vendors that don't use telecentric lenses, which I really don't understand, is because these systems are supposed to be inspecting, you know, measuring devices. And we measure everything on the board. So starting with a telecentric lens ensures the accuracy as, as you start getting smaller and smaller for components. If you're using a conventional lens, then components that are on the outside of the frame, they really get distorted and you're yeah. not really getting the proper data. Yeah, this is what we used to call like the fisheye effect in photography. It's the same kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. So, okay, you're, you're, you're doing this with a lens. You're able to look at really small stuff with a very small field of view, but surely that has a negative impact on your tack time. Absolutely, yeah. That's one of the things is as you start dealing with more and more projections, right, what ends up happening is you have to gather more data, process more data. That's when you start talking about, you know, dual computers, dual PC. So, of course, the issue that we're having with the prototype system is the fact that we know we have to speed it up. But even at that, we're still talking about uh, being able to process those boards. So it comes down to a trade-off, right? If you can't process the boards, you have an issue. If you process them poorly but fast, you still got an issue. So the first step is, of course, getting the capability. And of course, now we have the capability. Then the next step is speeding up that process so that we can accommodate people with higher tack times. Now, we do have several different types of systems out there, and we can change the lens to where perhaps with a 15 micron lens, we can still process an 0105 and down to an 03015, kind of, sort of, not really when we're talking about solder. But that would allow you to be fast. But if you require something where you're talking about smaller than that, then the trade-off is your FOV shrinks. It's going to be a slower process. Once again, if you can't see it, you got no choice. Wow, that's uh, really interesting, and it, it's good to see because you know we, we've talked to a few people here this week, and you know we we say technology moves forward, we move forward, technology moves forward, we move forward. Um, you guys definitely seem to be at the. Let, let's say at, at the sharp end of it, and I guess because you're working with semiconductor as well, this gives you good feedback for technology to move into the, the SMT area. Absolutely. It, what it comes down to is we're, we kind of have the luxury here in the U.S., right? Uh, we're, my company at HQ, we're dealing primarily with Asia. We're dealing with, of course, and Asia's got their own requirements, right? And dealing with semiconductor as well, dealing with LD, LED industry as well. So when we're tied so closely into all those industries and those emerging markets or those markets that are well beyond emerging, where we're talking about these guys are, are pumping out a lot of product, the technology that we see being used in semiconductor, the requirements that we see in Asia, right, where they're building all these complex boards, quite frankly, is driving our systems, driving the design of our systems. And what we see here in the States is that, that those types of requirements, 
they kind of are in lag, right? So we see that stuff kind of filtering in a little more slowly into the states. The nice part that I have with that is that my machine is already prepared for that. So leading edge is really based on the markets that you're taking care of, right? And you're absolutely right. The semiconductor keeps us on the leading edge. That's one of the biggest reasons why we entered into the semiconductor market because it's not cheap. It's not easy to do, but it's the right thing to do. Yeah, no, it's yeah. it's a demanding market in all sorts of ways. So, anyway, thank you for coming in, Brian. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, it's been a, a really good uh, set of talks this morning. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. I hope all of you out there that are going to click on the links and listen to them are going to enjoy them as well. Um, I want to thank all of my guests, uh, the team behind the scenes here at uh, Global SMT and Packaging who are doing a good job of putting this all together and keeping us all to time and keeping us honest. So I want to say thank you very much for listening and uh, see you next year. Saki's newly developed unique inspection technology assures measurement performance and data reliability in M2M connection. Saki's AOI and quality-driven production are major components to the success of the Smart Factory.